Uh, the um, listen. The reason we're doing all of this, the reason I'm doing this from my backyard, is is you know there's a there are a thousand different things that are demanding our attention that are a hundred different pressures of everyday society that, that say we need to do this or we need to do that. It's real hard to lose track of, of what all this means, what it's supposed to be about, how we're supposed to be enjoying it, and, and more importantly, what it might lead to in our life, you know, the quality of our life. If we can't answer that question, we're really spinning our wheels. And I've said many times that when I see people indulge in a, in a, uh, when they begin to subscribe to a political ideal, I see individuals that have come up against a brick wall with regards to what this faith leads to, what it means, what, what you can become from it. Surely, surely there's got to be something in this, all of these writings that are thousands of years old that allow us to lead a life that, where we don't have to adopt a bunch of stress onto ourselves so that we feel important, so that we feel justified in our actions for any number of reasons that people do it. We, for a long time, allowed academics to determine the quality of our spirituality. And it led to some interesting discoveries, to be sure. But it also led to another rabbit hole that didn't lead us anywhere. So when I read from these poetic and the prose edit, all I'm looking for is that idea or that thought process that might help me teach my children to go out in the world and be something. And I know Melina will probably hear this, so my heart goes out to her, it really does. And in the last month, I've had three friends that have lost their son. We found one of them in Florida, but another, her son was murdered, and then Melina lost her son. And I've been talking about Sigurd and the Dragon Slayer, okay. about this young man that grows up under the tutelage of an individual that does his best to instill in him the thought process that poisons his own mind. This cultural awakening that's happening. All of this stuff that we're going through, all of these thoughts about our life, our role in the earth and, and on the earth and in the spiritual dimensions or whatever, is changing radically for us. And yet for a long time, I know with my oldest son, the set of teachings that I gave him is much different than the set of teachings I give Scarlett. Not because one's a boy and one's a girl, well, that's kind of part of it, but more because I've changed. Hopefully I've grown some. It is imperative that we grab a hold of this spirituality with both hands because those children are our future. And I hate to see, I hate to see the pain that comes with that. When we raise our heads and we realize that we, the set of instructions we've been given in no way satisfies the yearnings of our own heart, how do we help our children deal that, with that when we're the ones that taught them what we thought? How do we help them change? How do we help them grow? How do we become better so that they might enjoy that life that we're just now beginning to realize we missed out on some of it? That um, may sound overly dramatic, but it causes me a lot of pain to think about these friends of mine who are in pain. And I don't like it. And I don't see political ideologies or righteous indignation or academic study offering the kind of consolence, condolences, the ability to counsel, the ability to comfort, the ability to support, the ability to help them rebuild, as I see in this, in this teaching of the Poetic and the Prose Edit. Because I assure you, it's in here. Melissa approached me about starting this Foundations of Faith for a lot of those very reasons. How do we build a faith that helps people live a good life? More importantly, I think today my thought process is how do I help people build a good life that they can help their children 
that that part of their heart that exists outside of themselves. Let's look at the gods and goddesses tonight. Because every one of them, as we go through the lore, has a unique challenge. And I think it's important that we understand what that looks like. So I'm going to read a little bit of the Prosetta. Uh, this is the one that's on sacredtext.com. Um, in chapter 20, it said, Then sang Gangleri, Who are the Aesir? They in whom it behooves men to believe. Who's men to believe in them? Har or high answered, the divine Aesir are twelve. Then said, third high, Kaf and Har. Not less holy are the Aesir, the goddesses, and they are of no less authority. We have that complementing, competing dynamic that's so important and repeated throughout the lore. And in the tales that I've already even talked about with Frey and Gerda, with, with uh, Sigurd and Brunhild, um, with many. Then said Thredi, or third, Odin is highest and eldest of the Aesir. He rules all things, and mighty as the, are the other gods, they all serve him as children obey a father. Frigg is his wife, and she knows all the fates of men, and though she speaks no prophecy. As is said here, when Odin himself spake with him of the Aesir, whom men call Loki, thou art mad, Loki, and reft of mind. Why, Loki, leavest thou not all? Frigg, methinks, is wise in all fates, though herself say them not. Odin is called all father because he is father of all the gods. He is also called father of the slain because all that, all those that fall in battle are the sons of his adoption. For them he appoints Valhal and Vingal, and they are then called champions. He is also called God of the Hang, God of Gods, God of Cargos, and he has also been named in many more ways. And there's a list of names here. That's up. I think there's 168 of them, but that that passage right there establishes a hierarchy. Now, if you want to become a high-performing individual in society, there are some things you're going to have to sacrifice. If you want to become a billionaire in this world, you're going to sacrifice family time. You're going to sacrifice going to your daughter's plays. You're going to sacrifice going to your son's football games. You're going to give up largely that home life that so many people value, that we all value, to become that high performer because you're going to have a goal. If you're going to be the ruler or the king and queen of Asgard, if you're going to be higher than all the rest of them, you're going to have to give up something to be in that position. You're going to have to deal with situations that, that cause growth, that stimulate the development of the individual. Oh, then, as we talked about last week, hung himself on the tree. He removed that, he killed that piece of himself that had him stuck in place. He learned the runes, heard the language, heard the songs of his ancestors, got a drink of the goodly mead, and then he gave an eye. He sacrificed an eye at Mimir's well so he might know all things. And Frigga lost a son. See, the great sacrifices of these people that they, that they endure, that they grow through, so they be, might become something more are, no, are not unfamiliar things for what we deal with in today's world. Everybody goes through these kinds of pains at some point. Our ability to rise above them, to deal with them, to grow from them, to learn to be okay with who we are, can all be gleaned from what is said in these tales. The level of sacrifice required to be at the top of the heap is demonstrated by Odin. And if we want to be at the top of the heap, there's some sacrifices we got to make too. Sometimes it's going to be a poisonous thought process that keeps us stuck in place. Sometimes it's going to be no longer dealing with that family member or relative that is intent on poisoning our minds to make sure that we understand how right they are, that we understand that, well, they know a little bit more than you do. They're kind of more important. Sometimes we're going to have to cut those ties. It's okay to love someone at arm's length. Sometimes that's what we got to do. If we want to become something more, if you want to fly with the eagles, you got to hang out with the eagles. You're not going to hang out with turkeys. It's just that simple. That's kind of my thought process with regards to this description of the gods and goddesses. And it starts out with the two most prominent ones, 
we all know what they've gone through. Then said Ganglaria, exceeding many names have you given him, and by my faith it must be indeed it must indeed be a goodly wit that knows all the lore and the example of what chances have brought about each of these names. Some people will want to call that an academic undertaking, and to some extent that would be true. It's a goodly wit that we know all the lore. And that we also know how he earned that name. What sacrifice did he make? What part of him developed so that he could be called something different? What force did he bring to bear upon a problem or situation? What solution did he offer? And this is what we're trying to learn here in the Lord. When we do ourselves a great disservice, when we base the foundations of our spirituality on some academic book. It's a goodly thing to know all the Lord. It's one of the reasons we're doing then Har made answer, it is truly a vast sum of knowledge to gather together and set forth fittingly. And it is, I assure you. I've written something like 40 books trying to do that. And I'm writing another one now that's going to be bigger than all of them. But it is briefest to tell thee that most of his names have been given him by reason of this chance. There being so many branches of the tongues in the world, all peoples believed that it was needful for them to turn his name into their own tongue by which they might better invoke him and treat him on their own behalf. When we talk about being folkish also, there's a real tendency to, to want to lend that to, well, it came up on the, on the uh, roof the other day, a, a woman was, was a, basically accosted at work for her beliefs, called a racist and everything else. And my reply to that is, is that, yeah, there's some people out there that are straight up, they're in it to win it. <laughs> they are die hard, so on and so forth. And they don't like other people, plain and simple. And there's another group of people that hate that group of people. And they're what we call universals. They think this ought to be for everyone. A lot of times they'll pick up on that. My contention is, is that just like it says here, that they turn his name into their own tongue by which they might better invoke him and treat him of their, on their own accord, on their own behalf. Every group of individuals, every tribe, every organization, every, every race grows up in an environment and the gods and goddesses that are apparent in that environment are uniquely suited to bring about spiritual development in the environment that group of individuals is in. Chaka Zulu would have no understanding of what Skagi means. Much as Genghis Khan, well, he might. I always use Pele, the, the uh, Hawaiian, got the Polynesian Hawaiian goddess of the volcano. Genghis Khan's not going to be familiar with that. Why would he be? What aspect of that fiery persona that literally can destroy the world would interest Genghis Khan? How would that help him develop to live in fear of that happenstance? How would Shaka Zulu develop worshiping Skadi, this goddess of the snow and the hunt? It's not a part of his environment. And yet, we, I've seen the movie, I've seen the tales. These individuals that worship that, that live there, they develop a spirituality, they develop a path of growth that's uniquely suited to the environment in which they live. Now here we all are in America, or, or South Africa, or Brazil, or all over the world. And we're trying to use these gods in the environment that we're in. We no longer have to wait for discomfort to make us want to grow. How do we do that? Because most of the world has been conditioned to hear when we say, I'm focused also true, that I'm better than you. That is what the world hears. I hate other people. Well, part of the way we succeed, part of the way we grow from that, is that we set that example that has one of understanding, not one of hate, not one of resentment, not something the next thing to be offended by, not some ego building characteristic, not the contamination of somebody else's mind, something can be right, but a, but a spell or spurt or a period of growth and development where we might be the kind of individuals that have a stable home, that are valued members of our community, that have loving wives and husbands, that have beautiful children that grow up to be healthy and strong, well-educated, and understand how the world works. 
This is how we build our future, not some radical political ideology. This is the environment we're in. And when we entreat Odin on our behalf, we're going to have to begin to understand some of that. But some occasions for these names arose in his wanderings, and that matter is recorded in tales. Nor canst thou ever be called a wise man if thou shalt not be able to tell of these great events. Now, are you going to be called wise if you don't understand the patterns of growth and each step of development that Odin went through to become who he's supposed to become? Because that's a pattern we are needing, we need to emulate. Then said Ganglary, what are the names of the other Aesir? Or what is their office? Or what deeds of renown have they done? Har or High answered, Thor is the foremost of them. He that is called Thor of the Aesir or Oku Thor. He is strongest of all the gods and men. He has his realm in the place called Frudvanger. And his hall is called Bilskinir. And in that hall are 500 rooms and 40. And that is the greatest house that men know of. It is said thus in the Grimness Mall, 500 floors and more than 40. So reckon I built Skimineer with bending ways of those houses that I know of all roofs, my sons, I know the most. Thor has two he goats and they're called Tooth Nasher and Tooth Gritter and a chariot wherein he drives and the he goats draw the chariot. Therefore he is called Oku Thor which means, according to uh, Cleesby Vingvason, a popular etymology, Oku is not to be derived from Eka, to drive, but is rather a Finnish origin, Uku being the thunder god of the Chudic tribes. Now, Johnson, however, allows Snorri's etymology to stand, that is, means to drive. He also has three things of great price. One is the hammer Mjolnir, the... Um, which the rhyme giants and hill giants know when it is raised on high and that is no wonder. So it is a destroying weapon. It has bruised many a skull among their fathers or their kinsmen. Now Mjolnir is this interesting thing because not only is it a destroyer of these rhyme giants and hill giants, it's also the implement by which we hallow the ground. It's what he used to hallow the burial or the uh, funeral pyre of uh, Baldur. It's what we use in weddings. And the all but small, it says, I alone, I alone am, am God of marriage. That hammer is a symbol that we hallow, that we use to hallow the ground we walk on, that we, in our holy ceremonies, we use it in naming ceremonies. Not only is it a destroyer, it is also a protective weapon. It is a defense against uh, all of those negative energies that we don't understand or can't comprehend or are unaware of. That's why Thor is the warder of men. That's why Mjolnir is so important. <laughs> Second thing he has is the girdle of might, and when he clasps it about him, then the godlike strength within him is increased by half. Yet a third thing he has, in which there is much virtue, his iron gloves. He cannot do without them when he uses his hammer shaft. But no one is so wise that he can tell all his mighty works. Yet I can tell thee so much tidings of him that the hours would be spent before all that I know were told. So for Odin, we're supposed to know all of his works because we're supposed to know that path of growth. For the warder of men, we may not necessarily need to know all of it. Now we have an aspect of faith. Now we have an aspect of an idea that this warder of men is actually out there working on our behalf, protecting mankind from these forces that would overrun and overwhelm us. It's good, long storytelling in those hours. Then said Ganglary, I would ask more tidings of the Aesir. Har replied, the second son of Odin is Baldr, and good things are to be said of him. He is best, and all praise him. He is so fair a feature and so bright that light shines from him. A certain herb is so white that it is likened to Baldr's brow. Of all grasses, it is the whitest, and by it thou mayest judge his fairness, both in hair and in body. He is the wisest of the Aesir, and the fairest spoken and most gracious, and that quality attends him that none may gainsay his judgments. He dwells in the place called Vridalblik, which is in heaven. And in that place may nothing unclean be, even as it is said here, Vridalblik is called, where Balder has a hall made for himself. In that land where I know lie fewest baneful rooms. That's a pretty tall order. But it's no wonder that this, this bright and shining, powerful individual that is born of wisdom, that is kind and gracious and loving, is the result of two individuals who have spent their lives developing into what they're supposed to become. 
who have spent all their efforts in growing into better individuals who have made that sacrifice and brought into the world that good son that we all look for, that good daughter that we all want, the beauty that we all hope to see in our children. And it is all a result of this coupling of two individuals who have spent their time developing wisdom, who have spent their time becoming something more, who have sacrificed those aspects of themselves that are not worth carrying forward. They did not pass on those poisonous thoughts that we see Reagan so skillfully pass on to Sigurd, to Balder. And look what he grew up into. And that's a terrifying thing for an individual that cannot or will not meet up to a standard. The third among the Aesir, the third among the Aesir is he that is called Njord. He dwells in heaven and in the abode called Noatan. He rules the course of the wind and stills sea and fire, and on him shall men call for voyages and for hunting. He is also prosperous and abounding in wealth, that he may give them great plenty of lands or of gear, and him shall men invoke for such things. Njord is not of the race of the Aesir. He was reared in the land of the Vanir, but the Vanir delivered him as a hostage to the gods and took for hostage in exchange him that men called Konir. He became an atonement between the gods and the Vanir. Njord has to wife a woman called Skadi, daughter of Thiazi, the giant. Skadi would fain dwell in the abode which her father had had, which is on certain mountains in the place called Thrymimir. But Njord would be near the sea. They made a compact on these terms. They should be nine nights in Thrymheimer, but the second nine at Noatan. But when Njord came down from the mountain back to Noatan, he sang the sleigh, Loath were the hills to me. I was not long in them. Nights only nine. To me, the wailing of wolves seemed ill after the song of swans. And then Scotty sang this. Sleep could I never on the seabeds for the wailing of waterfowl. He wakens me who comes from the deep to see mew every morning. This, uh, this Vanic deity who is the literal source of prosperity and abundance is, is Njord. So he... He was originally a hostage, and then he became a part of this tribe, this, this tribe that became a well-rounded, truly powerful group of like-minded individuals who would each sacrifice something to become something more. Njord gave up that home by the sea to live in the mountains with Skadi. Skadi is that fearsome daughter who sought vengeance and earned a shield and grew into something worthy of a lot of respect. Njord is, uh, I've been thinking a lot about him lately. I, I'm beginning to think that there's a real interesting dynamic there. When you have Njord and Scotty, you have the, the evaporation from the ocean and then up to the mountains where it turns into clouds and falls in snow and then flows down the rivers back to the ocean. There's a real elemental cycle involved in their relationship. It's a nice explanation and all good things come from the earth and those that live by the sea. Um, this is what this is the kind of thing we expect to see from those primitive kind of ideals. It's also something you expect to see when we're talking about a culture that might be five, six, eight, ten thousand years or older. A basic description of, of an observable phenomena in the natural world. Here's two individuals that, that subscribe to that. From the sea, all these great treasures come. The gentle range, prosperity, and abundance. And then it flows down the mountain along the rivers back to the sea. Then Scotty went up onto her mountain and dwelt in Thrymere, and she goes for the more part on snowshoes and with a bow and arrow and shoots beast. She is called Snowshoe Goddess or Lady of the Snowshoes. So it is said, Thrymere it is called where the Aussie dwelt, he the hideous giant, but now Scotty abides, pure bride of the gods in her father's ancient freehold. So she sacrificed that, that poisonous mentality of I need to get vengeance, you owe me something, I'm going to have what I want, I'm going to destroy you all, you people wronged me. She sacrificed that. She took a settlement. She grew beyond that small-minded idea of righteous indignation that was rightfully her due. And she became something more. She became that pure bride of the gods but not just any God, literally the God of abundance. And while the story is interesting, she picked him by the feet. Um, 
the dynamics of it are, are truly impressive to me. Now, Nior de Noatan begot afterward, afterward, and this is after he's married Scotty, two children. The son was called Frey and the daughter called Freya. They were fair of face and mighty. Frey is the most renowned of the Aesir. He rules over the rain and the shining of the sun and therewith all the fruit of the earth. And it is good to call on him for fruitful seasons of peace. He governs also the prosperity of men. So this Lord of the sea, this Vanic deity, his first son, much like Odin and Frigga, his first son, Frey, is this powerful, beautiful son that is fair. He's fair of face and mighty. He's renowned. He rules over the rain, something we all count on, and the shining of the sun. So we have this other solar deity and the fruit of the earth. So all of this stuff we're talking about, this charming of the cloud, the summer rain, the, the beautiful sunset, like it, I love sitting out back this time of the day when the sun's right at that angle, it's all gold and it shines through the leaves. This is that time when I, my mind drifts to those ideas of prey. And when I walk in my home and I see the abundance of my hard work and my efforts, this is what I think of. It's good to call on him for fruitful seasons and peace. So there's an aspect we need to consider when we're doing our charming of the plow, when we're doing our looking for our harvest in August and September. <clears throat> he governs the prosperity of men. He doesn't say that about anyone else. The Lord has already given us this gift of a God that will govern the prosperity of men. And he's probably not going to give it to a dick. But Freya is the most renowned of the goddesses. She has in heaven the dwelling called Folkvang. And wheresoever she rides to the strife, she has one half of the kill and olden half. Dang it, I forgot something. So Freya is this um, beautiful sugar britches type of dude. He's got everything. He's the prosperity of men. All of these other gods have to go through something to grow. What does this beautiful youth have to go through for him to become this fair of face and mighty and rule over the rain and the shining of the sun? His period of growth, his trial, his, his aspect of development comes from the transition from the young mighty warrior to the husband when he comes across Gerda, when he comes across something he can't deal with. When he sees someone so beautiful, it literally steals his heart. He has to grow into that individual. He has to sacrifice that very powerful phallic symbol of the sword to the next generation of warrior so he might become that loving husband and really be the true partner that we need to see that example of. And there is the prosperity of the earth, prosperity of men. Then we get to Freya. Freya is the most renowned of the goddesses she has in heaven. I already read that. I forgot about it. <laughs> She has in heaven that dwelling called Folkvang, and wheresoever she rides to the strife, she has one half of the kill and Odin half. As it is said here, Folkvanger it is called, where Freya rules. Degrees of seats in the hall, half the kill she keepeth each day, and half Odin half. Now, if you're a warrior in that day and age, and you're going to get on that boat, and you're going to row like a madman, land on some foreign beach, invade, rape, pillage, loot, and conquer, there's a real good chance somebody's going to shoot you in the face with an arrow. Right? That it's gonna have when it's an opportunity there, somebody's gonna take it. How would you convince an individual to set aside his wife and his children and his comfort and prosperity to go out there and seek adventure and fortune, knowing full well that he may not come back? He may die. Those children may grow up with a maternal uncle taking care of them, or a grandfather, or just the mother herself. Why, you're going to offer them a special heaven of their own. Folkvang, Bingo, Valhalla. Half go to Odin, half go to Freya. So you've got a choice. Now it's just not one special place, it's three. So there's this real powerful incentive that the quality of your life, how you die, what's going to happen. There's three different heavens for the warriors that die in the mass, that are die and are buried in the mass grave of the battlefield. That fear of the straw death and all that other stuff, those, those folks go to the halls of their ancestors. And that's where you really wanted to go. So you could go tell these wonderful tales 
of the children that you've raised. A warrior on the battlefield may not necessarily have that. They will go and be called champions. Every man wants to be considered a champion. Somewhere in his heart, somewhere in his life, he's wanted to do something great. And in a digital age, more often than not, we are finding fewer and fewer men who will get up, go out, pick up something heavy and put it down, go fight, go work hard, go build a company, go do something great, and they will settle for an academic idea and they'll be able to talk shit on the internet and social media. Huh. There's a challenge for us in there. Phrase Hall is says from near is great and fair. When she goes forth, she drives her cats and sits in a chariot. She is most comfortable. She is most conformable to man's prayers. And from her name comes the name of honor, fruit, by which noble women are called. Songs of love are well-pleasing to her, and it is good to call on her for the furtherance in love. Which is an interesting thing to say, because in one tale, in particular, this guy's kind of dragging his feet to go and meet the Aesir and become something better. She calls a sister out and cuts a wolf loose on his butt. So there's a furtherance right there, huh? But it's not going to come in this gentle, you know, Mother Teresa fairy, whatever thing you got going on. Scarlet, what's the name of the fairy for Beauty and the Beast or Cinderella? What's the name of the fairy for Cinderella? Oh, the fairy godmother. Yeah, that's it. There's a lot of times I see people get this idea of Freya as this fairy godmother thing. You see? So, and that's not the case. She's going to challenge you. She's going to push you. Love is not something you just sit back and take. You've got to work for it sometimes. You've got to make a sacrifice. You've got to be able to sit there and say, yes, I did something wrong. I caused you pain and it was not my intention. There's growth necessary in that. And sometimes it's painful as hell. So there's this aspect of Freya. She gets the champions and she builds men into good husbands. Women. Now, for her to get in that position, what has she got to sacrifice? Close that, son. What has she got to sacrifice? What has she got to deal with to grow? Well, her husband happens to be one of the ones that went away and never came back. Her two daughters literally mean, the na their names mean treasure. She is the single mother on her own, raising two children. And that's something that is not unfamiliar to a lot of the people that live in this world. Men were not able to make that sacrifice. Women were not able to grow. And they are raising children on their own. There's some kind of pain involved. There's some kind of challenge that was not met. And now we have women all around raising children on their own. This is Freya's challenge to become who she needs to become so she can be that goddess whose songs of love are well-pleasing. And it's good to call on her in the furtherance of love. Because her heart looks for it. I heard that. <laughs> then said Ganglia, great in power do these Aesirs seem to me, nor is it a marvel that much authority attends you who are said to possess understanding of the gods and know which one should call on for what boon soever, or are the gods yet more hard or high, yet remains that one of the Aesir who is called Tyr. He is most daring and best in stoutness of heart, and he has much authority over victory in battle. And it is good for men of valor to invoke him. Not just any man, but a man that's got some courage. It is a proverb that he is tier valiant, who surpasses other men and does not waver. And I've served in the infantry, and I know about men that are valiant, who surpass other men and do not waver. And we see him, he looks like a toss salad on his chest. We see their actions in dangerous situations and what they become men of valor. They are the ones that invoke tear. He is wise so that it is also said that he is wisest is tear prudent. So he's not going to make a dumb mistake. This is one token of his daring. When the Aesir enticed Fenris wolf to take upon them the fetter Gleipnir, the wolf did not believe them and that they would lose him until they had laid tear's hand into his mouth as a pledge. But when the Aesir would not lose him, then he bit off the hand at the place now called the wolf's joint. And tear is one hand. Got a 
this is tears grow. Well, how would you become the most valiant? How would you become that hero? How would you become that individual that deserves the respect for bravery and valor? You would physically make that sacrifice that is the in the best interest for the protection of your tribe. So you sacrifice a part of you who you are for the well-being of your community. This is the mark of the men who are valiant. These are our soldiers, sailors, airmen, so on and so forth. This is not something you call upon when you go to court. The next one, one is called Braggy. He is renowned for wisdom and most of all for fluency of speech and skill with words. He knows most of scholarship and after him scholarship is called Bragger. And from his name, that one is called Bragger Man or Bragger Woman. Who possesses eloquence surpassing others of men or of men, of men or women. His wife is Iden. She guards in her chest of ash those apples which the gods must taste whensoever they grow old. And then they all become young, and so it shall be even unto the weird of the gods. Then say Gangleria, a very great thing, methinks, the gods entrust to the watchfulness and good faith of Iden. And then said Har, laughing loudly, I was near being desperate once. I may be able to tell thee of it, but now thou shalt first hear more of the names of the Aesir. <clears throat> so if you're renowned for wisdom and fluency and skill and speech, probably doesn't necessarily mean you're a warrior. Obviously, in this community, is going to be accomplished. That wisdom, that ability to protect, to create an environment where Iden might thrive, where she might grow those golden apples, where everyone might be young. Um, it is poetry that inspires love, that keeps us young at heart, I think, sometimes. And I think there's an interesting dynamic there that speaks to our ability to communicate with each other to communicate with the old to the young, to remain young at heart, all of those wonderful things. And it comes from our ability to talk to each other, our, our speech and our skill with words. And we forget that, to be honest expression of who we are, how we feel about each other, what we might think, to share honest thoughts with each other, to build those bonds of friendship. Braggy and Iduna represent a very comfortable thing between good friends, uh, between man and wife, uh, the environment where she might thrive. And he's created this environment where she might thrive and look what it does. It keeps everybody young. There's, there's a real important, I'm probably going to elaborate on that because that's fired my imagination. Bragger as a noun means poetry. As an adjective, it seems to mean foremost, thus the phrase bragger caller which seems to be foremost of men, with apparent reference to poetic preeminence. preeminence. Heimdaller is the name of one. He is called the White God. He is great and holy. Nine maids, all sisters, bore him for a son. He is also called Halenskidi. Now that means the ram. And Guland Tani, which means golden teeth. His teeth were of gold, and his horse is called Gold Top. He dwells in the place called Himmenbjör, hard by Bifrost. He is the warder of the gods. Thor is the warder of men, this son of nine mothers, all giants that, that Loki gets uh, Thor to kill later on in the, in the tales. He's the warder of the gods. And that's an interesting thing. He guards what comes in, and yet he failed one time when three all-powerful female Jotuns entered Asgard. The love of gold, the bewitching of men's minds by gold, and the horse thief, the one that robbed the ability of men to work together towards a common goal. He sits there by heaven's end to guard the bridge from the hill giants. He needs less sleep than a bird. He sees equally well night and day a hundred leagues from him. And here's how grass grows on the earth or wool or sheep and everything that has a louder sound. He has that trumpet, which is called the Goller horn and its blast is heard throughout all worlds. Heimdaller's sword is called head. It is said further, him and Bjork is called, where Heimdaller, they say, I has his housing. There the gods and sentinels drinks in his snug hall, gladly good mead. And furthermore, he himself says in the Heimdaller Galder, I am, of, I am of nine mothers, the offspring. Of sisters nine, am I the son? So there's a, uh, when it talks about what he can do, he needs less sleep than a bird. 
He sees equally well night and day. He hears how grass grows on the earth or wool on sheep and everything that has a louder sound. Now that, that is literally an understanding of the flows of energy and life across the surface of the world. All energy moves in a way. I don't care if it's sound, light, gravity, whatever. It moves in a pattern. The warder of the gods has the ability to understand how these flows of energy work around the world, how these flows of life move across the surface of the planet. And it's no accident that he is the one in the Rig Thula that imparts this knowledge to men. And I've heard it surmised that it's done so, so that we might join the gods on their mission, whatever that might be, if we continue to develop in earnest this understanding that Heimdall has imparted in the Rig Thula. One of the Aesir is called named Hoder. He is blind. He is of sufficient strength, but the gods would desire no occasion that should rise of naming this god. For the work of his hands, it shall long be held in memory among gods and men. Vider is the name of one, the silent god. So we have a blind god, and we have a silent god. He has a thick shoe. He is nearly as strong as Thor, and in him the gods have great trust in all struggles. So, Vidar of the thick shoe is the one that takes vengeance for the loss of the prime example of Odin. And Hoder is the one that kills and still standing at the edge of the crowd, not being a part of everybody, the friend gentleman, not even given a name. He is the one that steals the light of the world because he started believing some other kind of nonsense that was whispered into his ear. It's a, it's a dangerous kind of predicament for us, the blind God and the silent God. One is called Ali or Vali, the son of Odin and Render. He is daring in fights and a most fortunate marksman. One is called Ullr, the son of St Sif, stepson of Thor. He is so excellent a bowman and so swift on snowshoes that none may contend with him. He is also fair of aspect and has accomplishments of a warrior. It is well to call on him in single combats. Not Tyr, Ullr. It is well to call upon Ullr in single combats. And I have read that he is the one that assumes the throne when the Vanir collapsed the walls of Asgard and Thor has to, and Odin has to go on his journey to become something better to take it from the man who is the god of single combats. It's an interesting dynamic. For Seti is the name of the son of Baldur and Nanna, daughter of Nef. He has that hall in heaven which is called the Glitner. All that come to him with such quarrels as arise out of lawsuits. All these return thence reconciled. That is the best seat of judgment among gods and men. Thus it is said here, a hall is called Glitner, with gold it is pillared, with silver thatch the same. Therefore said he, bides the full day through and puts to sleep all suits. So Baldur and Nana produced this sun in Forseti. So this bright, shining, beautiful god that is the epitome of a well-raised individual, prince, if you will, of, of two people that have done everything they could to become something better, his son, their grandson, has this wisdom where he has the compassion to hear the arguments of individuals and settle these things in a fair and equitable manner. This is who we call on when we find ourselves illiterate among the political system, the political writings, and the, uh, the halls of justice. Corsetti is the name of that shining individual that builds the legal structure for us to become something more. There's an interesting dynamic about the very foundations of civilizations involved in Forseti as this son of Bald, the grandson of Odin and Frigga. Also numbered among the Aesir is he whom called the mischief monger of the Aesir and the first father of falsehoods and the blemish of all gods and men. He is called Loki or Lopter and Helblin, son of Far Farbut Bauti, the giant. His mother was Laufi or Nal. His brothers are Belister and Helblin. Loki is beautiful and comely to look upon, evil in spirit, very fickle in habit. He surpassed other men in that wisdom which is called slight, a sleight of hand like a magician. And he had artifices for all occasions. He would ever bring the Aesir into great hardships and then get them out with crafty counsel. His wife was called Sigan, their son Nari or Narfi. He goes here into Loki, and that is just a, an absolute 
um, rabbit hole that I don't want to get into tonight, but though I, I will because there's some interesting stuff there. What he brings into the world, yeah, that's what we're going to talk about, I think, in a couple of weeks. Let's go down here to the ASIN year. Well, we don't really have time. I think next week we'll do the ASIN year, and the following week we'll go over that paragraph about Loki. And um, I don't know. No, you know what? I'm going to read this real quick, and we'll, we'll talk about it next week. Which are the ASIN year, Har said. Frigg is the foremost. She has that estate which is called Fence Lair, and it is most glorious, the Fence Hall. The second is Saga. She dwells in Sockbecker, Sockbecker, and that is a great abode. The third is Ear. She is the best physician. The fourth is Gaffian. She is a virgin, and they that die maidens attend her. The fifth is Fulla. She also is a maid, and goes with loose tresses and a golden band about her head. She bears the ashen coffer of Frigg, and has charge over her foot here, and knows her secret counsel. So that, that, that girl, she's got some understanding. Freya is the most gently born together with Frigg. She is wedded to the man named Odor. Their daughter is Nos. She is so fair that those things which are fair and precious are called Nasir. She is called Maldir and Horn, Geffen, Seer. Freya had the necklace for Singamon, and that's a whole other story of its own. The, the seventh is Sjalfian. She is most diligent in turning the thoughts of men to love both of women and of men, and from her name, love longing is called Siofni. The eighth is Lofen. She is so gracious and kindly to those that call upon her that she wins all fathers or Frigg's permission for the coming together of mankind in marriage of men and women. Though it were forbidden before or seemed flatly denied, from her name, such permission is called Lee. And thus also she is much loved of men. The ninth is Var. She hearkens to the oaths and compacts made between men and women, wherefore such covenants are called vows. She also takes vengeance on all those who perjure themselves. The tenth is called Vor. She is wise and of searching spirit, so that none may conceal anything from her. It is a saying that a woman becomes aware of that which she is informed. The eleventh is sin. She keeps the door in the hall and locks it before those who should not go in. She is also set at trials as a defense against such suits as she wishes to refute, thence is the expression that sin is set forward when a man denies. The twelfth is lean. She is established as keeper over those men whom Frigg desires to preserve from any danger. Thence comes the saying that he who escapes leans. Snotra is thirteenth. She is prudent and of gentle bearing. From her name, a man or woman who is moderate is called Snotra. The fourteenth is Gnaw. Her frig sends into diverse lands on her errands, and she has that horse which runs over sky and sea and is called Hoof Tosser. So there's 14 goddesses named her, and they're all equally as powerful as the Aesir. And all of those bear very special attention. Next week we'll get into it, and I some of my favorites. Matter of fact, that was the second book I wrote, and they, uh, they are not less holy than the Aesir. And they're very, very important. And there's a the foundations of civilization, the development of men and women as couples. The um, it's all included in the Asian year. And I think it's something we do ourselves a great disservice not paying more attention to. Next week we'll get into that, and the following week we'll get into Loki and how he screws all that. Anyway, thanks guys. I appreciate everybody coming in. It's good to see all of you. Um, so. Thank you.